Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the special live sem a webinar on thunderstorm asthma. My name is Vanessa McDonald, and I'm representing the Centre of Severe Asthma, Centre of Excellence in Severe Asthma. This centre is a national collaboration with investigators from around Australia who are experts in severe asthma. Our objectives and goals are to generate new knowledge relating to severe asthma, to contribute to the training of the health and research workforce in severe asthma, to generate collaboration and importantly to translate new knowledge into practice to improve the lives of people who experience asthma. This webinar is in response to the thunderstorm that hit Melbourne during the afternoon of the 21st of November. The weather event, led, the weather event led to an acute spike in asthma symptoms for many, many people. And this tragically resulted in the loss of eight lives. <coughs> On behalf of the Centre of Excellence in Severe Asthma, I offer our sincere condolences to the families who lost the lives of their loved ones. So this seminar is in response to that and we hope to provide insight into the causes of thunderstorm asthma and, and the treatments and management strategies to improve patient outcomes. The webinar is going to be presented by Professor Guy Marks. Guy is from the University of New South Wales, the Woolcock Institute of Medical Research, Liverpool Hospital and the Centre of Excellence in Severe Asthma. Professor Marks is a respiratory physician and respiratory and environmental epidemiologist. His research focuses on the causes, risk factors and prevention of lung disease and monitoring disease burden and management practices. Guy has pioneered a lot of work relating to asthma, particularly quality of life, and in the 1990s he did a lot of work related to thunderstorm asthma. During today's webinar, Guy will focus his attention on the questions that need to be addressed particularly the mechanisms and the prevention um, and control. So there's clearly a lot of interest in this topic. We have over 300 people registered for the webinar this morning. How it will work is that Guy will do a presentation for around 30 to 35 minutes and then we'll open it up for discussion. With such a large audience, we'll do our best to facilitate all the questions that come in However, please forgive us if we can't address each of them. What we ask you to do, if you have a question, to type your question into the question box. And these will be facilitated by Steve um, Maltby. If you wish to ask a question verbally, you can do this by sending a request via the chat box. And we can then unmute you and then allow facilitation of live questions um, via verbal discussion. So I'd like to um, therefore open this webinar, introduce Professor Marks, and um, welcome you all to the, to the seminar this morning. Thank you. Thanks very much, Vanessa. Um, I hope you can hear me OK. Um, thank you for um, asking me to do this presentation. This is. Uh, as you said, a, a very tragic circumstance, uh, and uh, it, it's I, I'm very honoured to be asked to uh, to make this presentation on this occasion, and to review some of the information uh, that we learned by investigating a previous uh, episode of thunderstorm-related asthma that occurred in Wagga Wagga in, uh, in New South Wales in 1997. Um, so what I'm proposing to do, as you said, for about half an hour is to just go over some of the things, that, the investigations that we did around that episode and what we learned from it and what the response to it was. Um, we, we got some information that, about who was at risk, about the, the, uh, the mechanism by which it occurred. Uh, we've got some data suggesting that it's a fairly common event. And I'm going to describe for you what the public health and, and medical uh, response to it was. I also want to discuss the question of whether uh, ryegrass is the only uh, uh, allergen that can be responsible for this. And in doing that, I'll refer to some of the evidence from overseas studies. 
And then finally, I, I, I want to uh, raise some questions that came into my mind in, in thinking about where we are at the moment with our understanding of this event. Um, and uh, I hope that this will trigger some uh, discussion and uh, questions from others who are online. So um, this this is a photograph. I don't know whether you can you see my pointer, by the way, yeah. Steve or Vanessa. Is there? A... Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is a photograph of that I'm told is a photograph of a thunderstorm outflow over a field which I think contains probably ryegrass. This is a image, a radar image, a weather radar image that was taken on the 30th of October 1997 um, at 1400 Universal Time. That, that means Greenwich Mean Time, uh, which was um, uh, late in the day uh, here. And what it shows is this thunderstorm uh, uh, passing over southern New South Wales. This is Wagga here, Tarkata, Juni. Uh, here's the Murray River down here, uh, Albury here. Um, so this shows the arrival of this uh, thunderstorm uh, on the, at that on on the evening of the 30th of October 1997, and at around that time, within the space of a few hours, uh, this fairly small town in in uh, emergency department at Wagga Base Hospital. Uh, had 215 attendances for asthma, um, 41 of whom required admission to hospital and two of whom were intubated in intensive care. So it's not a big hospital and it was a fairly major event that overwhelmed the hospital on that night. Um, so w w we actually, the research group that I'm involved in was was actually doing some other research in, on environmental uh, factors in asthma. In fact, we were looking at Alton area moulds uh, as a risk factor for asthma in Wagga Wagga at this time. So we had a team of investigators down there in which uh, we were able to use that and some of the equipment that was down there to do some investigations. One of the things that we were interested in was who was at risk uh, what were the what previous symptoms or diagnoses identified people who were at risk? What previous treatments reduced or increased the risk? Whether people with particular allergies were more at risk than others, and if there are any actions that people could could were took during the storm which either protected them or gave them a greater risk. And the the the, the traditional study design that's used to look at epidemics of any sort is a case control study. This this uh, is, for those who are not familiar with this, this is the same study design, the same type of study that's done when you have food poisoning outbreaks, when you have an episode of uh, unknown severe acute respiratory illness. Uh, in fact, it's the same study design that was used in 1949 to first show the association between smoking and lung cancer. So it's a very old study design that's been used to look at risk factors for disease. Uh, it's a case control study. Um, and what we did was uh, we thought we regarded the population at risk as being all the people in Wagga and for this purpose we chose people aged 7 to 60. And we were particularly interested in the subset of those people who had asthma. And um, we considered everybody who attended the emergency department for asthma over a period of four months leading up to the epidemic as being the population with asthma severe enough to require them to come to hospital. And we divided that population into two groups. One group who were the people who, were, who attended during the thunderstorm. This is what we called the cases. People who attended on the night of the 30th and 31st of October, who were the thunderstorm cases. There were 183 of those people. There were, in fact, 121 people who came to hospital at Wagga over the preceding four months. So there were more people who came on this one night than came over the preceding four, night, four months. Uh, but they were the controls. They were people who came to us to uh, <laughs> hospital because of asthma at times other than the thunderstorms. 
So we compared, if you like, the normal asthma attenders with those that attended during the thunderstorm. And we got most people who uh, we approached agreed to complete questionnaires. And we did skin prick tests on them as well to identify what they were allergic to. And most people we asked to do that also agreed to have the skin prick tests done. Um, and these are the results. What we showed was that um, this on this right-hand column is the people who were what I called before the cases, the people who came on the night of the thunderstorm. And on this left-hand column are the people who came at other times, the controls, the people who didn't come on the night of the thunderstorm. And you can see that most people with asthma have a history of hay fever, but many more of them had a history of hay fever amongst the people who attended at the time of the thunderstorm. Virtually everyone, 90% had a history of hay fever. So that was a very strong predictor of, that was a very strong predictor of risk of the, of the thunderstorm. Whereas the other factors that are associated with asthma were more common in the people who attended at other times. What we can see here is that only 64% of the people who attended at the time of the thunderstorm recognized that they had a diagnosis of asthma before the event. In other words, over a third of people who came during the thunderstorm with severe asthma enough to cause them to come to hospital didn't know they had asthma, whereas most people who come at other times already knew they had asthma. The other interesting thing here is that um, overall only 17%, a very small proportion of people who came during the thunderstorm were taking inhaled corticosteroid medications. That's the common preventer medication used to control asthma. Only 17% of people who came during the thunderstorm were taking that, whereas half of people who came at other times were taking inhaled steroids. So we thought that not taking inhaled steroids was a risk factor for uh, um, coming during the thunderstorm. So the strong things out of this were they all, nearly all had a history of hay fever, a third of them didn't know they had asthma, and very few of them were taking preventer medications. And in terms of allergy, the other outstanding fact here was that, again, virtually everybody who came during the thunderstorm was allergic to ryegrass pollen. All but 4% were allergic to ryegrass pollen. Now, ryegrass allergy is common in Wagga, and amongst other people who come at other times, nearly two-thirds were ryegrass allergic, but not as many as were during the storm. So being allergic to ryegrass pollen was a strong risk factor. There were slightly more people, well, there were more people who were allergic to Cladosporium, which is a mould, uh, but actually the, the mould that we were most interested in, which was Alternaria, was less common in the people who, allergy to that was less common in the people who presented during the storm. So the key feature here is that virtually everybody who presented during the thunderstorm was ryegrass allergic. If you weren't ryegrass allergic, you had very low chance of being affected by the thunderstorm. Um, we also asked some questions about where people were at the time of the thunderstorm. And um, this was not as useful as we had hoped. We found um, that being outdoors, we had thought that maybe being outdoors during the time of the storm or just before the storm might be a risk factor for uh, being affected. And we didn't find that that was the case. So being outdoors as opposed to being indoors was not a risk factor. However, being outdoors or indoors with the windows open at the time that the storm began was associated with an increased risk of asthma symptoms. So it wasn't a risk factor for actually being having to attend the hospital, but it was associated with an increased risk of asthma symptoms. So these findings were we thought were a bit equivocal. So in summary about risk, who is at risk, what we found is that pollen allergy and hay fever were a necessary, although not sufficient, condition for being affected by the thunderstorm. Many cases had no previous history of asthma or only mild asthma. Being indoors at the time of the storm might have been protective, although this was not certain. 
and using inhaled steroids regularly may also have been protective. <coughs> so that was about risk factors. Now the next question is about the mechanism or the what I've called here the aerobiology and the meteorology interaction. So this is a photomicrograph of pollen grains that are rupturing and releasing these tiny starch granules. These tiny, the, the pollen grains themselves are quite large and in fact they're large enough to get stuck in the nose or in the throat and they don't tend, they're too large really to go down into the lower respiratory tract, down into the airways to cause <laughs> asthma. But they contain these starch granules, these tiny granules that contain high concentrations of allergen and that are small enough to be inhaled into the lower respiratory tract. And what you can see here is some of these pollen grains are rupturing and releasing these starch granules. And it's these that we think go down into the lower respiratory tract and cause the problem. <coughs> so we know that all of the events occur in the, that the most of these thunderstorm related events, including the one that I'm describing now in Wagga, occur during the grass pollen season. We know, as I've just shown you, that ryegrass allergy is a strong risk factor for uh, this event, for, these, for being affected by the thunderstorm. And we know that large, we know from the work of Bruce Knox and their, his colleagues that large pollen grains rupture and conditions of moisture and release these small respirable size, inhalable size pollen grains. But what's not clear is what's the link with thunderstorms and why it only occurs in some thunderstorms and not in others. And uh, John Colhoun is now retired but from formerly from the Bureau of Meteorology and it's he that described this association with thunderstorm outflows. And this is a diagram um, that he gave me of a thunderstorm outflow in which there is an updraft, this sort of sweeps across fields as I see it, sweeping the, lifting the pollen grains up into the atmosphere and then forcing them down to ground level so that the pollen grains or any other particles that, that come into its pathway will be concentrated in a high con concentration at ground level. That's the theory. Uh, now I'll show you what happens in practice. This, this is a recording from a automatic wet, from the automatic weather station at, at Wagga Wagga Airport on the 30th of October 1997, covering the 12-hour period from midday until midnight. Midnight being here, Mid midday to 2 a.m. In fact, and you see all these different uh, parameters that are being measured. And what even I can see, not being a meteorologist, is something very dramatic happens here, which is at about 21.42, <laughs> about just after half past nine at night. Just after half past nine at night, there's a rapid increase in wind speed, change in wind direction. Soon afterwards, there's the onset of rainfall, a rapid reduction in temperature shown here, very rapid fall in temperature. All of this happens very quickly. And this pattern apparently signifies the arrival of the thunderstorm outflow. Now, it just happens that because we were, as were doing some work in, in Wagga at this time, there were an, a number of Burkhardt spore traps operating, which are, these are basically barrels that record the um, things that are deposited out of the air and they were sitting on top of some buildings in, in Wagga Wagga and it's possible to use the information from these spore traps using photographs like, like this essentially to count the number of pollen grains and this was done by Mervy Kosky um, who counted the number of intact pollen grains and ruptured pollen grains. The ruptured pollen grains being ones that have released their small submicronic particles. 
And here what you can see is that at about in the hour between 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock, there was a massive increase in the concentration of both intact pollen grains, shown here, and empty pollen um, about an 8 to 12 fold increase in the concentration of pollen grains and empty pollen husks. And then straight away afterwards when the rain came, the air was clear again and there were very few of them. So it lasted only for less than an hour, uh, this massive increase in concentration of pollen grains. So in this next slide I've superimposed those two slides, those two graphs together. So you can so see that the increase in pollen concentration coincides with the arrival of the front of the um, thunderstorm outflow. And there's one other piece of information. This line represents the time of the first ambulance call on that night. So all three essentially coincide. Um, so the arrival of the thunderstorm outflow coincides with this large rise in the uh, concentration of intact and ruptured pollen grains and with the onset of the epidemic. I think fairly clear evidence that at least in that one episode, that was the mechanism. Um, so the next question is, is this just a very rare event? Uh, it hasn't been described that often. There are some several reports in the literature. But if we were to believe just what's published in the literature, we might think that this was a fairly rare event. So what I did was, I got the data from emergency departments in six rural hospitals in New South Wales, from Tamworth down to Albury. I got the data for the for emergency attendances for asthma over a uh, four-year period, 1995 to 1998, for every day. The number of people who attended for asthma every day in each of those six hospitals for over four years. And I calculated what would be the expected number of admissions in each hospital in each day for asthma, taking account of various trends and weekly trends and seasonal trends and so on. And then I defined epidemic days as days when there were many more admissions than expected, more than four standard deviations above the expected number. And the probability that that would occur by chance is less than 0 0.0, was approximately 0.01%. So I thought it was fairly confident that this, these events were really epidemic days. And there were 48 such epidemic days over the six hospitals in, these, in that four year period. And then I selected some control days. They were days when the number of admissions was approximately what you would have expected them to be. In other words, was not an increased number. So there were 48 uh, epidemic days and 191 control days. That's a total of 200 and something. And I sent those dates to the meteorologist, to John Calhoun, without telling him which were the epidemic days and which were the control days. And I asked him for each of those 250 days to look at the automatic weather station data and tell me whether there was a thunderstorm or whether there was a thunderstorm outflow. And so this is the results of that. This shows that on the control days, thunderstorm outflows and thunderstorms were fairly rare. 8% of days on the control days there were thunderstorms. 3% had thunderstorm outflows. But on the da epidemic days, they were not rare. And overall, one about a third of epidemic days were associated with thunderstorms and thunderstorm outflows. And in fact, the association was strongest with thunderstorm outflows. And in the spring and summer, October to January, over half, just over half of all of the asthma epidemic days were associated with these thunderstorm outflows. So I don't, I think we can conclude that thunderstorm outflows are a common cause of epidemics of asthma. Uh, by the way, it's thunderstorms without outflows were not strongly associated with, <coughs> with these episodes. So it is the thunderstorm outflows, not the thunderstorms themselves, that seem to be associated with asthma epidemics, and they're common. Uh, and that's basically what this says.
that uh, in late spring and summer, over half of epidemic days were associated with thunderstorm outflows. So we, we as a result of this, were able to show uh, who was at risk. Uh, we were able to show that people who were not taking regular medications, uh, preventer medications were at risk. Um, we were able to show that it was quite common. Um, and um, so we, the, the public health authorities and the clinical uh, people working in Wagga and in the relevant local uh, area health service, as it was then called, um, felt there was a need to do something about this and they mounted a public health response which really had two elements. One was a health promotion campaign which advocated that which tried to promote the use of uh, inhaled corticosteroids amongst people who wheeze and sneeze during spring uh, to remind them to take their asthma preventer during spring. And the second was a health service um, intervention which was designed to get um, where the Bureau of Meteorology was able to predict the occurrence of these thunderstorm outflows during spring and summer and when they were predicted to occur they advised the health service who prepared themselves for the event by getting in more equipment, getting in more uh, uh, bronchial ladders, uh, freeing up beds, doing the things they needed to do in order to prepare for an influx of patients. So I just, before I move on to the next part of the talk, I just want to acknowledge the number of people, I think most of whom, many of whom have retired <laughs> now or have moved on to other roles, uh, but uh, there were, these were the people who and the uh, organisations that were involved in, in that work that I've just described to you. Um, so I now a little bit to talk more generally about this. Um, one question that arises is, and I know this has been some of the subject of discussion just in the last few days, is, is ryegrass pollen unique? Is this just due to ryegrass pollen? And I'm just looking at what's been published internationally, that it's not, because there are certainly other episodes that have occurred overseas which don't seem to be related to ryegrass pollen but are related to other grass pollens or to moulds. And the moulds that have been mainly implicated have been Alternaria and Cladosporium. And probably one of the most famous epidemics of asthma attacks, regular epidemics of asthma attacks, was the ones that was reported in Barcelona in the 1980s, which was not related to thunderstorms, but was related to an aerobiological phenomenon and it was unloading of of um, soybean in the in in um, Barcelona harbour and when they were unloaded and the wind was blowing from the harbour across the town there was always an epidemic of asthma attacks the people the hospitals filled up and it was attributed it was shown eventually that this was due to soybean husks so it's not unique to ryegrass pollen but there are some characteristics that I think we can now identify that are necessary for this phenomenon to occur. And I, I've identified four of them here. The first is that there needs to be an abundance somewhere in the environment of potentially allergenic biological material and usually that will be grass pollen or fungi. And secondly, there needs to be the occurrence of a thunderstorm outflow which concentrates the material in the way that I showed to you before concentrates the material, um, the biological material in a, at, at near ground level in people's breathing zones. Thirdly, there needs to be some process which leads to the formation of respirable size particles, particles that are small enough to enter into the lower respiratory tract. So they may be the release of pollen starch granules as occurs with this ryegrass or maybe in other cases it's germinating fungal spores. And fourthly, there needs of course to be exposure to people, uh, but, but not just any people, but people who are sensitised to the biological agent, whether it's the mould 
or the grass pollen, previously sensitized to it, and you have untreated airway hyperresponsiveness, or if you like, untreated asthma. Um, even if they don't recognize themselves as having, that's why I've used the word un, untreated airway hyperresponsiveness. They may not have diagnosed asthma, but they have twitchy airways, twitchy inflamed airways, which are sensitized to, uh, to the allergen, whichever it is. I think they're the four criteria that need to, they're the four conditions that need to have been met for the episodes to occur. So I think there are a number of important questions. I, well, so I, I guess what I've shown you so far is some of the answers, some of what I think are the, uh, 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 the mechanisms that underpin the event. But there are many questions, I think, and the others will have questions that I haven't thought of. But there are some questions that I have thought of, and I, I think I'll, I'll put them out there now and as a, as a way to sort of get discussion started. So one question is, why was this event that's just happened in Melbourne so severe? It seems to be the most severe event that's ever been reported. Uh, and there are a number of possible explanations, and more than one of them might apply. Um, the most obvious explanation is that there was a very high concentration of allergen-containing respirable particles, allergen-containing um, ryegrass particles. Now, we, we don't yet know that for sure, but that's one obvious possible explanation. The other is that the exposure was more widespread, because Melbourne's obviously a lot bigger than Wagga Wagga, and it may have been just much more widespread, the exposure, than previous exposures. But the third possibility, which I have no evidence to, to suggest this, but it is a question that is a bit concerning, is were people in this case more susceptible than in other cases? Is there some reason why the people who are exposed on this occasion were more susceptible to this adverse effect than people who've been exposed previously? And I'll come back to that point in another couple of slides. As I say, I have no evidence for any one of these three things, but they're questions that come to my mind. Um, another question which is well outside my area of expertise, and there are many others, I think, who are on this call who have more expertise in this than I have. But I think it is interesting still to speculate a little bit about what is the mechanism for the release of the allergenic particles. Uh, water associated with the thunderstorm is one possibility. But well, the thing that a little bit concerns me about that is that some of these thunderstorm outflows in the past don't seem to be associated with actual rain. Um, so the, it, it's the wind event that it's the there are other meteorological changes that are not necessarily associated with rainfall that that can trigger them. Uh, but it's still possible that water is the trigger event. The other thing that if you remember back to that automatic weather station data, the other big thing that happens during the um, thunderstorm outflow is a rapid change in temperature, a rapid fall in temperature. And I guess it's possible that that's a triggering event. And this is, I, I, I just had a recent discussion with John Calhoun, and he was speculating about whether that might be the trigger. But So I think there's still some work to be done about that mechanism. Um, now the next question is, we have some fairly strong circumstantial evidence from the epidemiology that in taking and how corticosteroids is protective. And we also, by the way, which I didn't allude to, know from laboratory studies, there's lots of reasons to know from laboratory studies that inhaled steroids or steroids protect against allergen-induced airway hyperresponsiveness and uh, allergen-induced um, airway narrowing. So there's good reasons to believe, both from a basic pharmacology and physiology point of view, and also from the epidemiology, that taking inhaled steroids before the event uh, is likely to protect you uh, from, uh, from having a severe attack. But there are still questions to be asked about this, like how long before the, the episodes, how long do people need to take it for? What doses is a sufficient dose? 
and how more, I mean, they're sort of technical questions in a way, but more practical is just how do we operationalize that? How do we get people to take inhaled steroids uh, who might be at risk? The other question, and this comes back to my earlier point about is there any reason why people might be more susceptible now than they have been in the past? The question, I guess, that worries you us as doctors a bit is, is there any asthma medications that people take that actually increase their risk of having a bad attack? Is there anything that we might be, that people might be taking that could actually be making matters worse? So we need to consider that possibility. And one of the things that people want to know is if we're going to, if we can predict these events, apart from just giving alerts to the hospitals to tell them to be ready and the ambulance service to tell them to be ready, is there anything at the time that people who might be at risk could do to protect themselves? Should they stay indoors? Should they stay and wind up the windows in the car? Should they, um, people have asked, should they wear a mask? Um, or, or is there any immediate treatment that you can take at the time of the event, either immediately before or during the event, that might protect you? I don't, again, I don't know the answer to any of those questions, but I think they're important questions to, to, to address. And then there is another, the, the other issue is, is sort of our health services questions. Again, they're well beyond my area of expertise about how to manage health service response to emergencies. And there's a lot of people who've spent a lot of time on planning emergency responses. One of the particular features of this type of emergency response is that it's a very diffuse, geographically diffused environmental hazard. It's not like a, a crash or a bomb or something like that. It's, a, it's, it's in many places. And one of the things that health service planners may need to consider is how they respond to such a diffuse environmental hazard such as this. And then, my last slide really is just was, is the point that I made, I guess, in that article uh, published recently in the conversation, um, which is the more general point about health protection in Australia. Uh, I, I just wonder if we, in having, if we are as well served by for health protection in Australia as we could potentially be. To my mind, the hazards that we face are many and varied. <laughs> they are both microbial pathogens and non-microbial uh, air pollutants and in this case uh, aerobiological pollens and things. They come in various different vector, in various different vehicles. They come in the air, in the water, in food and in, and in bloodborne. They're human and animal vectors. Some of them are well-known, well-recognized things like tuberculosis um, and or influenza, and some of them are unknown, <laughs> like severe, so like SARS, um, and and like this one, in, to, to a certain extent, large, largely unknown. Um, my mind, this sort of variation, this sort of heterogeneity, this sort of complexity requires an integrated, multidisciplinary approach. And I have to say that for a country of 20 million people, we can't afford to have eight separate, integrated, multidisciplinary approaches. We're lucky if we can afford to have one. Uh, and uh, I believe we need to have one, and that for, therefore I think it needs to be at a national level. Um, so that was the basis for my call for a national Health Protection Agency for Australia. So I might just finish at that point. Um, I, I, I've covered quite a lot of ground, I guess, and I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'm also happy to listen to the experience of others and the comments of others. And um, I'll hand it back to Vanessa and Steve, I think, to moderate the discussion. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Guy, for an excellent presentation this morning. We have had a couple of questions come through um, online. 
So I might, um, I might get Steve to read out each of the questions so that all of the participants online can hear them and then we'll facilitate the, the discussion around that. Uh, hello, Guy. Uh, thanks for an excellent uh, talk there. Um, so I guess I'll start with the first question, was, which was about the uh, Wagga Wagga event in particular. And the question was, was there any follow-up done on these patients at, that had their first asthma-related presentation at that event? And I guess the question being really at whether they, that turned out that that was their first incident of asthma or whether the thunderstorm asthma was really quite different from uh, asthma disease. Uh, that's a very good question, and it's a question that occurred to us. And it's a question that we tried to get funding to answer, <laughs> but we couldn't get support. For, for, for addressing that question. So I think it is a very important question and I, it's an, I don't know the answer. What, what, what the, does, does the thunderstorm induce asthma that lasts for a long time? Um, or does it convert somebody from being not having asthma to having asthma <laughs> uh, over a long period of time? And we, we really don't know the answer to that question. I think it's an important question. So that can be added. That should be added to the list of questions that, uh, <laughs> that I didn't put up. Yeah. Um, is there any evidence that thunderstorm asthma per se has a higher than expected mortality or severity? And do we have any understanding of uh, what's the most effective uh, approach in the acute hospital situation to dealing with it? Okay. Well. I'm, as I said in the Wagga episode, there were two people who were admitted to intensive care, but as far as I'm aware, nobody died. Um, and I think it's rare, if, if at all, that people have uh, uh, have died in previous episodes like this. But I think there have been some. Uh, this is an allergen-induced uh, episode of airway inflammation, and you would predict that this should be sensitive to treatment with steroids. But of course steroids take some time to work and apart from, the answer to that question is I don't think there's anything specific about the way in which this should be treated other than the way we normally treat people who come with exacerbations of asthma, which is by giving them high dose steroids and high dose bronchodilators and ventilatory support as required. Um, the, I, I don't believe that there is any specific treatment that's different about the management of patients who present with this. Others may have something to contribute on this, but that would be my view. I'll maybe just try real quickly. I've had a message from Adrian Venter in Wagga Wagga saying that he they've completed a follow-up study. I'll just see real quickly if I can unmute Adrian and if he can um, sure. perhaps that would be a quick comment. <clears throat> Yeah, I don't know. Can you people hear me? Uh, yes. We can hear you, yes. Yeah, so, so we have just completed our, our study. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to, to collect all the cases, but we managed to get 15 of the controls and 15 of the, um, of the actual cases. Um, what, what we did identify is that in both the cases and the controls, all of them went on to have a long-term asthma. And again, there was an association between uh, the ACQ score and the asthma control, whether we're taking inhaled corticosteroids or not. So those that were using intermittent uh, corticosteroids um, remained with high ACQ scores and uncontrolled asthma. And um, the ones that were using the inhaled corticosteroids had very well controlled asthma. The other interesting comment is that uh, none of the cases had a severe uh, if, event again in the 15 years since the initial event, even though there were a few um, thunderstorm uh, um, events uh, documented in Wagga at least in 2004, of which I don't have much data. Um, and then the, the other interesting uh, finding was that there was a, a, a difference in lung function that the, the cases, the, the mean FEV1 was 99% predicted, whereas in the uh, cases it was 85% predicted 
Um, so, so these were, were interesting findings that we had. Thank Thanks, you very Andy. much. For that. Um, I, we had another question here, I guess, uh, two that were related. Um, one was the, whether you recommend that people uh, should potentially get uh, tested for their uh, uh, sensitivity to ryegrass pollen. And another of the potential role of allergen-specific immunotherapy as a treatment. Are you addressing the question to me or to Mark? Uh, to, to Guy, I suppose. Guy. Yeah. Uh, okay. They're tricky questions. I, I, I don't. Uh, I don't have a definitive answer for either of those questions. I think. Uh, the, it's unlikely to be helpful to do the skin prick testing. The reason for doing the skin prick testing in our study was to demonstrate the association with uh, ryegrass allergy. Uh, but in fact, you could see that, in fact, hay fever itself was a strong was strongly associated with um, um, with the risk of, of of being a thunderstorm patient. So I would have thought that that's why we use the term wheezing and sneezing. So if people who, who have a history of hay fever symptoms should consider themselves to be at risk for it. I don't think there's a need to do skin prick testing. The role of immunotherapy, well, I'm not an expert on immunotherapy and I, I, I don't know that I can make much comment about whether it has a role in reducing the risk. I, I don't know if there's any evidence either way. <laughs> whether it reduces the risk. Um, there are a couple, of, so we had a question, so what is the evidence that asthma medications may increase the risk? And a mention of a Gavro study from 1997 showing that regular uh, Saba use increased response to allergen challenge. Do you think that's the, a potential relation or do you think uh, it, it's, it's other than the um, Saba usage? Well, that would be the concern, whether or not uh, regular use of, of uh, freak, too frequent use of, 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 of short-acting beta agonists, such as Ventolin, regularly without using inhaled steroids might increase your risk of an adverse uh, reaction. That, that's one of the things that we, we should investigate as a part of a, any, I think, investigation of this. But there is there is that me the study that's being referred to is e it is evidence to s of a mechanism that could explain that. Um, and would you have any comment uh, whether any of the difference in um, kind of the severity of the response may be a difference in sensitivity of uh, individuals in urban areas versus rural areas? Um, well, I'm not quite sure what the listeners getting at there as to whether or not uh, th that certainly these episodes have occurred in rural areas as well as in urban areas. Um, whether or not, and they've occurred in Melbourne before too. The the issue really is why this episode was more severe than previous episodes, not why it's more severe in Melbourne than in rural areas and mm. um, they've occurred in London in the past as well. So they've occurred in both urban and in rural areas. So I'm not sure that there's much to be said about the difference of urban rural differences um, that, that helps very much. I think the big difference between the urban and the rural areas is obviously in urban areas there's a lot more people exposed in, in a, within any given uh, geographical uh, area. Sure, and we just had another comment uh, online that potentially another factor in Melbourne may have been the actual specific timing of the storm during the day, which would be something else to look at, where it occurred sure. during a kind of peak hour when when more people would have been out in the street at the same time. That's a good point. So the time when people, what people were doing at the time, may may be a risk factor. That's a good point. Whereas the Wagga Wagga episode you were mentioning was uh, quite late in the evening, where in the evening, yeah, late people in the people evening, people would have been calm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
so were, uh, were there any um, features of anaphylaxis in the severely affected cases, uh, I guess, uh, in, in the Wagga Wagga uh, episode that you uh, mentioned? I don't know. I can't recall that we asked about features of anaphylaxis. Uh, I, so I don't know the answer to that. But I, my understanding was that, you know, anecdotally, that these were just severe episodes of asthma. Um, right. So but I can't. I can't. Uh, I, we didn't ask about urticaria and angioedema and things like that. Um, a comment, uh, more than a question, that uh, so only two fungi were discussed in the presentation um, and there are many other wet weather fungi that are not usually tested for example, um, and my pronunciation will be poor, but basidiospores. Um, basidiospores do you have any yeah. comment on that or, or I guess on, on potential other allergens that you briefly mentioned? Sure, well, I, I, I think there are people on the call who are much more expert in this than I am, and I'm certainly not an expert on fungal allergens. The ones that I refer to are the ones that have been shown previously to have been associated uh, with these episodes overseas, um, but there may well be others that could be looked for. Um, and, and, and I think the, the sort of general point is that fungi that are, are capable of being allergenic and are capable of creating s spores that are small enough to enter the lower respiratory tract would, would be, t would be um, potential culprits uh, in, in events like this. Uh, I had a, another comment from uh, Adrian in Wagga Wagga mentioned that the two ICU cases in the Wagga Wagga episode did not have anaphylaxis but rather had severe asthma. So uh, perhaps that answers that earlier question. Uh, I had a comment here from uh, Frank uh, Tian uh, about the Melbourne episode. It was uh, noted that uh, a high number of the presentations in the ED uh, were from individuals uh, with Asian uh, ethnicity uh, who have a history of hay fever but no asthma uh, and the potential that this uh, ethnic population profile may also have been a factor in the difference between the different episodes. So another uh, kind of factor to consider um, with, with kind of how severe the episodes uh, are. So that's interesting. So, uh, so Frank's experiences, but also that many of them had no history of asthma, which is in both those observations are interesting. Um, do we have any evidence yet from Melbourne that you're aware of whether there was a difference in the pollen counts in this particular episode that may uh, explain the difference in severity? Well, I'm not the person to ask. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know I don't have the evidence that, that, but there may be people on the call who, is there anybody who would like to comment on that? Uh, we have a comment from Connie uh, Catalaris. Oh, Connie uh, Catalaris, yeah. Hmm. Saying that, uh, yes, the pollen counts were very high. Yeah. That's probably what I would have expected, but yeah, that's interesting that the numbers are, yeah. Thanks. Um, and, and I guess again with the Melbourne and, and potentially you may not be the best to answer this but we may get a response from the viewers of whether there's any follow-up currently already occurring in the Melbourne event uh, re regarding um, meteorology, pollen counts, etc. I'm sure there are people who, uh, there, are, there are some plans underway but somebody may wish to discuss what they're doing. So we've had another comment that uh, the pollen counting in Burwood is still to be uh, still to be performed. So I think a lot of be, due to the recentness of that episode, there will be a a lot uh, of of data and analysis and assessment that really does roll out of this. Sorry, I'm reading questions and comments as we go. They're coming fast and furious. Well, you're doing a good job, Steve. 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, Frank uh, Thien has commented that a, a preliminary comment from Ed Newbigin uh, suggests that there are cladosporium and alternaria at the Arabology slides uh, in the Melbourne episode. Well, it's, uh, uh, it would be, as well. Yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to um, look at the the allergic, you know, the skin prick test profile of the people who are affected, and compare it with pe do something similar to what we did in Wagga to do a case control study, looking mm -hmm. at sensitization status of those because there was such a clear relationship to one specific allergen in in the case of the um, Wagga episode that it it made it obvious what was the um, what was the causative um, agent. Um, whereas looking at what's in the air may not be so obvious because there's going to likely to be a lot of different things in the air, and sure. uh, it may be easier to work out by looking at what people, what the affected people were actually sensitised to. Um, a question relating again to back to Wagga Wagga episode. Was there? Did you assess, and was there any information about whether people were uh, taking antihistamines? Um, we, I now that's a good question, and I can't remember whether we asked about antihistamines. Um, but I, um, yeah, I can't. I can't answer that question off the top of my head. I'm afraid. But the the you know the the mechanistic evidence would suggest that it's steroids that are the most protective. But I don't know um, whether there's any evidence that antihistamines would be expected to be protective. Maybe somebody can help me out with that. Mm -hmm. I'll let you know if anybody uh, chips in. Uh, I've had a comment here that uh, with, there's, uh, with the follow-up from Melbourne, also Ambulance Victoria is currently uh, compiling data to, to look at uh, data from the um, data from that episode. Uh, and a note that uh, the pollen counts in Burwood are indicating high uh, numbers of ruptured pollen, uh, uh, much like you reported there from the Wagga Wagga episode. Mm -hmm. uh, Adrian's uh, mentioned in revisiting the cases from Wagga Wagga, most were not using antihistamines. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, with Wagga Wagga, and uh, I guess in relation to the Melbourne, uh, is there any recollection of the number of the cases that were under 18 years of age versus uh, adults, or, or or what demographic seems to be hit hardest by these uh, thunder thunderstorm asthma? My recollection is that actually there were not that many children. It was mainly adults, um, and that may have something again to do with the timing. <laughs> uh, it was at 9.30 at night, um, but that was my recollection, in, and I don't, but of course I don't know what the situation is in Melbourne, uh, whether there are a lot of children affected or not. But if it was during the daytime hours, you would expect you know, children to, to be affected as well as adults. Mm. Um, I guess there's two, kind of a comment here and a question. Uh, one is the mention that in Wagga uh, they're still running an alert campaign um, uh, since that initial incident. Uh, I guess um, another question is, is really what should be the, the public health um, message of, uh, uh, in, in, for future thunder, thunderstorm asthma? Well, I, I mean, I I think that the that the response in Wagga was an effective is an effective response based on the information that we have so far. Um, I think it's the be it's based on the evidence, and it it, it uh, that that is the response which I had suggested previously uh, of, of advising people that they should take inhaled steroid the people who wheeze and sneeze. I'll try and find the thing again. Um, 
if you wheeze and sneeze during spring, take your asthma preventer. So a health promotion campaign and an alert campaign. I think the one, I, I do think that we need a little bit more information around what advice you can give to people at the time of the event, uh, apart from staying indoors. <laughs> Is there any other advice that you can give to people? And I'm not sure that I know the answer to that, but that may be where we need some further investigation. But I think the 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 basic nat the basic um, uh, response that's been implemented, and I'm glad to hear it's still being implemented in in the Wagga area, is one that would work well across all of the area that's at risk for this, basically southeastern Australia. Guy, we have a small audience in the room with us here in Newcastle and we have a question from the audience. Good. Okay, um, my name's Doug. Um, just a question in regard to the Wagga event, in particular the follow-up, which I, I think it was Adrian who's just commented on that follow-up. Of those 15 people that, that had asthma at that particular time, uh, how many were undiagnosed asthmatics? And of those people who've obviously, it seems to me, the comments suggest that they've gone on to have diagnosed asthma, uh, had a, they had an inflammatory cell profile done on those, and were any of those ears in a um, And I've also unmuted Adrian, who may want to comment on this. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so the, the only follow-up that we've, that we've really done is to collect these chaps and to do an ACQE uh, questionnaire on them, as well as lung functions to check whether they actually do have airflow obstruction um, and whether they have bronchodilator uh, reversibility. But we did not do any other more invasive testing on, on these um, the cases. Were there any uh, blood samples that were taken around the time that did full blood counts at all? That you know of that might have suggested a zimitaria? I think Guy might have that information. No, we didn't do any. We didn't collect. We just did skin prick tests. We didn't. We didn't do full blood counts. I mean, no, they would have had some of them would have had blood tests done in the hospital, but we didn't get access to that information. Uh, we've got a comment here from Peter Gibson mentioning that uh, in relation to antihistamines, that at least with allergen challenge uh, research shows that antihistamines reduce the early response, but generally not the late asthmatic reaction. So that might yeah. also come to your, uh, your, your comment uh, in thunderstorm asthma specifically. So just to follow up on that, for people who are not familiar with what, so not everyone might be familiar with what Peter's referring to an early response and the late response, so that you, we would expect, based on the laboratory profile of people who are given allergen to inhale, that they get an immediate episode of airway narrowing, um, and then that, that may be relieved, but then it's likely to recur over sort of several hours later, which is um, that, and that's the late response, and that's the one that Peter's saying is not not prevented by antihistamines. Uh, and a comment by uh, Pam Hicks here that uh, also, as you mentioned, of a lot of uh, the individuals with thunderstorm asthma presenting, either not knowing they have asthma or not being diagnosed, really raises uh, the issue that they, they generally won't have access to the inhaled corticosteroids in the first place to really even be taking that, that preventer. Yeah, that's true. That, that, I mean, that, that is a limitation of... <laughs> And, and it's very hard to know how you can protect those people. One of the things I think that, and this is a bit anecdotal, but there were some people who said they wheezed but they didn't have asthma. So what part, part of the issue is about diagnosis. Um, so some people who will tell you that they have hay fever with wheezing. Um, and they, so they haven't got a label of asthma. So that's why I think the the public health message that went out in Wagga was if you wheeze and sneeze, then you should take inhaled steroids during spring. So uh, um, trying to encourage people to recognise that wheezing is significant, and it's not simply a 
a, a manifestation of hay fever. Right, so another public health message. Uh, I, I, a question or a comment, I guess, of why is the term allergic asthma not being used in association with thunderstorm asthma, given the evidence you've presented uh, that it really seems to be an allergic inflammation that's uh, or allergic phenotype of asthma that's really causing that or, or, or the population that's severely affected? Well, I mean, uh, people can use that term, <laughs> allergic. It, 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 it's certainly, it's, it's, an, it's an allergen, this is an allergen mediated response. Um, we know about asthma that there are a number of different ways in which people can, in which airway narrowing can occur. And one of them is by an, an allergen-mediated response, and that's certainly the case here. This is um, definitely an allergic mechanism, that's true. And I guess two more comments here specific to the Melbourne um, situation and follow-up. One from Sam Mir, I believe, sorry if the pronunciation's off, uh, that lots of uh, children have been um, reporting to ED and for example at Royal Children Hospital uh, there were uh, around 400 visits for asthma on that day, uh, right. whereas uh, and Anne-Marie Southcott has uh, commented that they're also seeing an additional increase in asthma presentations over the several days following the storm event itself. That's interesting. So some of those may be late allergic responses, I guess. Or else, unlike the episode in Wagga, the, the allergen was uh, hanging around for a long time in the air. I guess we right. don't know, I don't know the answer to that, but that's interesting. I guess two other questions kind of relating to the mechanism in terms of the meteorology in the storm is whether there's any data on potentially electric fields uh, within a thunderstorm as well as uh, on ozone itself uh, as a potentiator of, of the effect. Yeah, well, this is getting well beyond my area of expertise. Uh, I can only... Um, I can only say that the when we that, that the the phenomenon that was most strongly associated uh, with those epidemics when I did that showed you that case control study from this um, this one um, the phenomenon that was most strongly associated was this outflow phenomenon. Um, not thunderstorms in their own, not thunderstorms alone. <laughs> thunderstorms right. without outflows were not strongly associated with the epidemics. It was the outflow associated with thunderstorms that was responsible. So um, what that means, I can only relate to you what I've been, what John Calhoun had described to me, <laughs> which was this um, Sorry, I'll try and uh, was this phenomenon? Oops, this phenomenon. Um, so uh, I, I don't believe that it, the electrical activity is is a is always associated with this. I don't I don't think that it's. I, I think it's the the downdraft and the updraft that's the key thing, not the electrical activity. But as I say, this is well beyond my area of expertise. Um, all I can comment on is the is what the epidemiology showed, which was the strong link to thunderstorm outflows. So it's, it's more that the thunderstorm itself is a, a vehicle to that processes the pollen or the allergen, say, and, and awesome. then unfortunately delivers it to the um, individual rather than um, um, a lot of the other factors. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've had a, a fairly active discussion, um, but it's probably time that we start to wrap things up. 
really appreciate um, your attendance this morning, Guy, who's um, doing this webinar live from Switzerland. Um, and also appreciate the attendance of all the people who have registered in their, their um, question time. If we have not answered any of the questions um, that you have posed or that you think about at a later time, please feel free to contact us uh, via the uh, Severe Asthma webpage. So we're just going back to the slide where we can put that information up on the screen for you. There's a contact um, button via the webpage. So send us any questions that you may have remaining and we'll attempt to um, answer those next week for you. So again, thank you for participating and the webinar will be, brought, uh, will be uploaded online uh, to the website so that if any of your colleagues had intended to come or would like to view the webinar at a later stage, they're able to do so. Uh, thanks to Steve for organising everything and I hope you have a good day. Thanks Vanessa.